Well, you, you use even larger type on your notes than I do. <laughs> Good evening. I, hmm. Oh, that's like OK. Um, <clears throat> I have to warn you, I am a writer. I'm not a speaker. I will do the best I can, and I think we'll, we'll be fine. <sighs> I've, I've slowed down written at the top of every page because I tend to, to get into a rush to get to the bottom of the page. So, uh, I would like to thank the festival organizers and Davin for inviting me to speak tonight. I've been quite excited about the opportunity ever since Davin first contacted me back in September. I did say excited. I'm excited to speak about Canadian whiskey to an audience that is largely Canadian and largely whiskey drinkers which is not to say large whiskey drinkers, like me. I feel the need to emphasize that excitement because if we're going to be honest, we'll have to acknowledge that the majority of people who think of themselves as whiskey aficionados, and even the majority of people who think of themselves as simply whiskey drinkers, don't generally think of Canadian whiskey as exciting. I note no gasps of surprise, so I'll move on. Um, <laughs> I am excited about the opportunity. I'm also excited about the prospects of Canadian whiskey. Uh, there's work to be done, uh, work that may need to go in a somewhat different direction than it is currently, but that's what I'm here to talk about. And when I've said my piece, if anyone's interested in hiring a marketing consultant who's a complete but passionate novice, I'll have cards available. I'm just, <laughs> just kidding, kidding. Uh, so let me tell you something about my history with Canadian whiskey as a path to explaining how I think things are developing and can develop further. I was born in 1959, when whiskey was the freaking king still. You know, we're coming back now, but we're still nowhere near where we were back in those days. However, I didn't know anything about that because my family was a beer drinking family. Um, I don't, can't remember a bottle of wine being in the house, and I only remember one bottle of, I think, Old Forester that someone had given to my father when my older sister was born. The only one who, uh, who drank whiskey in the family was my Uncle Don, who would drink shots of Windsor with his beer. He, he married into the family. <laughs> I didn't really run into Canadian as a drink myself until after college. I attended bar for a while, where the core drink group, group of drinkers chose Canadian mist and grapefruit soda. There was one woman who preferred grapefruit juice because it was healthier. Uh, obnoxious youngster that I was, I wanted nothing to do with these old farts preferred drink. And as I was writing that, I started thinking and realized that they were probably about, at that time, they were probably about 12 years younger than I am now, which is <laughs> sobering. Uh, something worse happened uh, a few years later that put me off Canadian for years. I was at a party with a bunch of old college friends, and near the end of the evening, my friend Tom and I got glasses of punch. It was non-alcoholic punch, uh, which is probably why there was still plenty of it left. And we were sorely disappointed and decided it needed strengthening. I saw a big bottle of Windsor sitting there, and adding it to that blue citrus-based punch was a terrible mistake that really did no favors for any of us, me, Tom, or the whiskey. I didn't touch Canadian for 15 years. And then I started writing about whiskey in the mid-90s and realized that people were willing to pay for words about Canadian whiskey, too, so why not? In 2001, I managed to pull together what was then an amazing collection of Canadian whiskeys for a piece in the Chicago Tribune. Uh, I had Canadian Club 10-year-old, Weiser's Very Old, Forty Creek Three Grain, Gooderham and Warts, Lot Number 40, Pike Creek, and one of Henry Price's Hirsch selections, a single cask 12-year-old. That's when I really started to learn what Canadian whiskey could be. I tasted more Canadians over the next 10 years, and I found some I liked. And I started to have a habit of, of picking up a bottle of Weiser's 18 at the Duty Free on the way home from every trip. But what really tore things open for me was Davin's book, Canadian Whiskey. And following that uh, distillery trip to Alberta and Windsor with Davin and Dave Broom in 2013, that's when I finally learned enough about Canadian whiskey to not only understand it, but to gain an appreciation for what it was and had always been. And, and you know, what it was and had always been had been right there in front of me. Canadian whiskey makers had tried to explain it to me, but I resisted. I remember interviewing uh, Crown Royal Master Blender Andrew Mackay back in 2012, and I had only listened to him. <laughs> he said, 
It's designed to feel and taste this way. It's quite distinct from bourbon. It's quite distinct from scotch. We try to be very distinctive, and we know that we have to make our distillate the best it can be. We can't just depend on the wood. All the whiskeys are aged separately in individual barrels, different batches. We make it this way on purpose. Now, actually, I looked at the uh, interview again, just checking some after I had written this. He said, we make it this way on purpose three times in the course of the interview. So. And that was it. That was this essential nugget that I was going to reap from, from Devin's book. And then visits to Alberta Distillers and Black Velvet and Highwood. But I didn't get it then. I just sat there listening to Andrew and nodding and smiling and thinking, yeah, 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 it's sweet and it's blended. I get it. But you know what really did finally open my eyes? Uh, Many of you will probably not be surprised to learn that it was a tasting with Dr. Don Livermore uh, later on that trip with Davin and Dave. After a tour of the huge Windsor plant, uh, Don had laid on a tasting of over 40 spirits for us. N nosing and tasting, I should say, since some of it was spirit right off the column at 190 odd proof. Three of those right off the column spirits were the corn, rye, and wheat distillate for the base whiskeys. One was their polar vodka. The differences were stunning. Even at that high proof, the distillates were clearly tinged with their respective grains, while the vodka was as neutral as the wind off a glacier. And then I tasted a whiskey aged in a red oak barrel. Wow, it was brutal, aggressive, plank-lickingly strong wood. What the hell are you going to do with that? I asked Don. And with a very patient look, he said, I'm going to blend with it. <laughs> And finally, there was my old friend, uh, Weiser's 18, the 18-year-old whiskey that I had come to love. Still tasted grand, so I said, thinking I had this figured out, what are the whiskey streams that you're blending into this? You know, because there just had to be more of that good flavoring whiskey. It's all base whiskey, Don says, this time with a big grin on his face. I was simultaneously dismayed, because how could I be so damned ignorant, and elated, because this was it. This was the instant when I finally grasped the whole idea of Canadian whiskey, the potential and the beauty of blending the streams that Andrew and Davin and Rick Murphy at Alberta Distillers had tried to explain to me. And now I can actually start my talk because, as is my terrible habit, I've completely buried the lead again. Uh, I really need an editor. <laughs> so this is what Canadian whiskey Canadian distillers have to do to seize the greatness and respect they need and deserve. Tell people what you are. Didn't matter 40 years ago, because people then bought on ads and reputation and celebrity endorsements and promotion and w w what their family drank. And then vodka started to go crazy, and what whiskey was finally started to matter. Whiskey had to explain what it was. Every other whiskey got there first, it seems. People already understand them pretty well. Scotch, 200 years of brand history. Peat and sherry, tartan and bagpipes, blends and single malts, even if they may regret overselling the whole single malt thing a little bit now. Bourbon, fine corn liquor. Southern hospitality and mint juleps, Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. New barrels and more rules than you can shake a stave at. And, well, Jack Daniels, you know. <laughs> Japanese whiskey. Uh, it isn't scotch, and apparently that's all that matters to most people. Go figure. <laughs> Irish, see now. <laughs> Irish just amazes me. Take the makers of the dominant Irish brands, put them all in a room, and they can't agree on what I Irish whiskey is. <laughs> Been there, seen it, it is the damnedest thing. But it doesn't really matter because Jameson outsells everything else at a great rate, and everyone knows what Jameson is and understands it until more dew comes in a jug and Bushmills for Catholics. Easy peasy. <laughs> but Canadian? No one under seems to understand that defining characteristic, which is that Canadian whiskey is blended whiskey. Smooth, creamy sweet, blended whiskey. Or worse, they do understand it, and they think things like, well, Canadian is blended, and in whiskey, that means it's not as good. Or Canadian is smooth, and whiskey needs to be in your face! <laughs> or Canadian sweet, and that's just gross. But here's the thing. The majority of scotch is blended. A lot of really freaking good Irish is blended. Irish is smooth as glass, and people sing about that. I'm not, don't, I'm not gonna sing, don't, don't worry. Bourbon is sweet, and it makes great cocktails because of that. So why are those downsides for Canadian, but not other whiskeys? It's because you're not telling your story. 
Sorry, the page turn slows me down. You remember I mentioned the story I did for the Tribune back in 2001. Another quote from Henry Price, the importer, from that story. Tiny scotch distilleries can do well because the whole industry has such a reputation, a heritage. The distillers in Canada have never put out any information about themselves. They just send product out through big international companies. So no one is really passionate about Canadian whiskey. Now, obviously, present company excluded, but wow, bullseye. It's not necessarily easy to explain to people how the whole blending thing works and why it's the heart of it, but you have to. Because the blending process is brilliant. It's why the person who gets the respect, the honor, the reverence in Scottish whiskey isn't the master distiller, it's the master blender. Blending is truly an art, taking different streams of whiskey, different distillates, different barrels, different ages, different distilleries, different finishes, and bringing them together to make something that is consistently unique in quantities huge or tiny. The blending is the thing, and the breadth of palate Canadian blenders can work with is astonishing. Take the Alberta dark batch, dark horse, whatever you call it, whatever country you're in. As an example, if I tell folks it has 1% sherry in the blend before they taste it, they almost always just shut down. So it's not really whiskey is a typical response. But if we taste it first, or even better, if we mix up some Manhattans with it and taste those first, and then I tell them about the sherry, they're much, much more interested. Let the whiskey do the talking, just shut up a little, and then tell them how it's done. That's gonna work with some people. With others, it's gonna be getting them to drink it the way it's meant to be drunk. Let me explain with three more really short stories. First, my 25-year-old son drinks Canadian whiskey. Why? Mad Men. Someone brought a bottle of Canadian Club to a party, and they made highballs like, like Don Draper and his buddies, and surprise, they liked it. Bunch of 20-somethings drink, drinking what is usually, pardon the inconvenient truth, a gray hair drink in America. Second story, quite similar. Friend of mine, about 40, professional woman, confirmed Miller Lite drinker. Suddenly she's drinking Crown and Coke. So I ask, how'd that happen? She and her husband one year, went on, just on a whim, went to the Grey Cup. She goes to get a drink. Well, what, what is there? There's blue light. It's like, no, 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 just no. There's rum and Coke. Yep, hate rum. And there's Crown and Coke. So phew, I tried it, but the second one, I was a Crown girl. Third story, Do, I've been doing a series of whiskey tastings for my college alumni association. The whiskey's made friends, except for the Canadians. Too sweet, not sippable, damn it. So two days before one of the tastings, I had a brainstorm and I called the restaurant. I said, look, when you serve the Crown Royal, put an ice bucket and chilled bottles of a good ginger ale on the table. At the tasting, I told folks, taste the Crown straight. Before I could ask them anything else, I said, if you want, now put some ice in the glass and add a splash of the ginger ale. Much better reaction. One guy even asked me for the recipe for that Crown Royal cocktail. <laughs> Not kidding about that one. <laughs> and he went to the same college I did. Look, you and I both know that there are definitely sipping Canadians. Uh, lot number 40, Crown XO, Highwood 90, 40 Creek, um, the older Alberta premium bottling that we found at a ridiculously low price last night, yay. Uh, but Canadian overall is a cocktail whiskey, a highball whiskey, and it's so damn good at that. Uh, Vio and soda is my dive bar call these days because I like drinking it better than scotch and soda. Yeah, I, I said that. Canadian Manhattan with a big fat Luxardo cherry is so damn rat pack you can almost hear Dino singing. So stop talking about Canadian whiskey like it was scotch, like it was American rye, or like it's Irish. It's not. Davin gets it right. This is your thing. Your whiskey, your style. Don't make excuses for it. Challenge people with it. Don't tell them it's blended. Tell them why it's blended. Canadian whiskey is ready to step into the light. This is its time, the time it's waited for, the time it deserves. But like any other star taking a close-up, it needs the right makeup, it needs the right costuming, it needs the right lighting. That's our job. We need to explain Canadian whiskey to bring people to that moment of understanding. We need to show it at its best, not as something that it isn't. Stop trying to force this great whiskey into the wrong glass. Let's celebrate Canadian whiskey as Canadian whiskey. Thank you.